And here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Our guest for the hour is Jane Mayer, staff writer for The New Yorker, author of uh, multiple best-selling books, her most recent, Dark Money, The Hidden History of the Billionaires Behind the Rise of the Radical Right. So that song that Bob Dylan was just singing, um, talking about uh, the John Birch Society, where, you know, not only Fred Koch, the patriarch of the family, Charles and David's father, but Charles Koch also was a member of the John Birch Said. John Birch said he called what General Eisenhower, President Dwight Eisenhower, a communist. Yes, they thought Dwight Eisenhower was a communist. Um, it, they, they saw communist conspiracies behind all kinds of things, and I have to say that that I'm told that Charles Koch didn't buy all the far-fetched conspiracy theories, and he really went in a slightly different direction. He was more preoccupied with becoming a, a kind of a radical economic libertarian, meaning that he wanted to get the government to just let businesses do what they wanted to do and let the free market rule America. And so he's he's fought to keep taxes really low, get rid of almost all regulations on business. This is really what he's focused on, not so much on communism. And you also describe uh, in the book how some of the gatherings of this caucus of the, of the billionaires uh, has also at, at times uh, made it uncomfortable for the established Republican figures like Senator John Cornyn at one point and uh, and uh, talk about the uh, their ability to. Uh, empower the radical right among, in Congress? Well, I mean, when Obama was elected, there was a dilemma within the Republican Party. It was, do we work with him and try to get as much as we can, the sort of old-fashioned way of politics where you make compromises, or do we just simply go on strike? and try to demonize him and, and obstruct everything, shut down the government. And there was a big argument, actually, that took place in front of the Koch donor group very early on. And the side that won and won over the hearts of this donor group was the side of Jim DeMint, who was then the senator from South Carolina, who said, obstruct, obstruct, obstruct. And from that point on, and we're talking— He would later quit, right, and go went, to become a, the head of the Heritage Society. That's right. Heritage um, Foundation. That's right. But at that point, it was a choice, and this group put its money into stop Obama any way you can. And so part of also what I try to tell the story of here, and you have to kind of follow the money through the chapters, but is that it's it's not just an election force. It's it's th this club has become a force of obstruction against governing, so that when Obama proposes the health care plan, this group funnels money to many, many different front groups that then, uh, unseen to the American public, pop up and oppose the health care plan and, and, and disrupt meetings. I don't know if people remember those town hall meetings during, the, the, I think it was the summer of 2010, um, when there was just kind of pandemonium breaking out. And a, a lot of that were, there were actually sort of plans laid among this group to pour money in, get people all riled up, and make them think that that this was going to have death squads, things like that, that were, they got people very upset. And the connection to the Tea Party? They put a lot of money into the Tea Party. At the, I, I started writing about them in, in the summer of 2010, and at that point, uh, the spokesmen for the Cokes were saying they had nothing to do with the Tea Party. I then went down to a, a weekend meeting that the biggest Coke group was was holding, Americans for Prosperity, in Austin, Texas, and there they were giving seminars to Tea Party members on how to organize. So it, they, they really and the and the people I interviewed down there evidently hadn't gotten the sound bites because they were saying. Are you kidding? The Tea Party? We've been into the Tea Party before it was cool. And, and so it's, it's a—it's, um, I think what's interesting to me is that, as you've been saying, there have always been Democrats with a lot of money, Republicans with a lot of money. The history of the country has been, you know, certainly big money players. What you've got here is almost like a third party that is the money party. It's a conservative, outside pressure group that is acting as a—, a force field pulling the Republican Party particularly to the to the right. With three and a half times as many employees as the Republican National Committee. And a larger budget, 
um, by two times the budget that the Republican National Committee had in the 2012 presidential campaign. So you're talking about really a, a, a pretty professionally organized operation. Uh, there's a new new um, paper that I thought was really interesting by Theda Scotchpole, who is a professor at Harvard. It came out just last week. It's called The Coke Effect, and it describes what's been built by them and their allied donors as akin to a national party. Hmm. Oh, well, uh, Jan, I'd like to ask you, in July, speaking at the NAACP annual convention in Philadelphia, President Obama praised the Koch brothers for their involvement in the campaign to reform the criminal justice system. This is what he said. Bringing people in both houses of Congress together, it's created some unlikely bed bedfellows. You've got Van Jones and Newt Gingrich. You've got Americans for Tax Reform and the ACLU. You've got the NAACP and the Koch brothers. No, you got to give them credit. You got to call it like you see it. Well, a, a day after President Obama's speech in July, we interviewed Mark Holden, senior vice president and general counsel for Coke Industries, on why the Koch brothers were getting involved in a coalition to reform their criminal justice system. Charles Koch and David Koch are classical liberals who believe in expansive individual liberties in the Bill of Rights and limited government. And so if your goals are to honor the Bill of Rights and to remove obstacles to opportunity, especially for the poor and the disadvantaged, you have to be in the criminal justice arena. And to answer your question, you know, as, as Van pointed out, what worked 20 or 30 years ago doesn't work today. And we have to have the intellectual honesty and courage and humility to correct that. In our businesses, we do that all the time when things aren't working. And I think to Van's point, what we're seeing happen in the states is really a template for what should happen at the federal level. And making sure that everything we do enhances public safety and that it honors the Bill of Rights and treats everybody in the system as individuals with dignity and respect, particularly victims, law enforcement, the incarcerated, the accused, and their families. That was Mark Holden, a senior counsel for the Coke Industries. Uh, you, this whole issue of them getting involved in criminal justice reform. Well, I mean, Mark Holden's a very eloquent advocate for criminal justice reform, and the Kochs have long cared about criminal justice reform. But what people may not realize is that they've pushed a different kind of reform than most liberals have. What they would like to do is get rid of many crimes that have to do with pollution, that have to do with corporate crimes, tax crimes. They want to weaken prosecution of companies like their own. Now, there is a tiny overlap. If you did a Venn diagram of where the the far right and um, everybody else overlaps, they, they would like to see uh, sentencing reform for uh, drug offenders at this point, which nonviolent drug offenders, which, you've, you know, it's an it's a important issue. It's good they're talking about it. It's not something they've cared about until 2014. And I have a new piece out in The New Yorker which notes that in 2014 they launched a huge public relations campaign to change their image. They're involved in, in what David Axelrod described as one of the biggest rebranding efforts anybody's ever launched. And um, I see this as certainly part of it. And the reason I do is, you'll see if you read this book, um, there are tapes. There are tapes that were leaked out from one of their meetings where they describe how they need to change their image. They ha After they did not win the presidency in 2012, despite the money they put behind Mitt Romney, they went back to the drawing board. And they tried to figure out what they were doing wrong. And they did a huge number of polls. And they came to the conclusion that the public thought they were greedy and um, didn't trust them. And so they speak in this tape about how we need to prove that we have good intent and we care about other people. And at that point, they launched a number of programs that have to do with doing good works for the poor. So I, I see this as quite related to that. What